Nobody saw that. Hello, my spooky darlings. Welcome to my channel. Welcome back if you've been here before. I'm Kelly, the Paranormal Housewife. I wanted to do something a little bit different for this video. Um, in this video, I wanted to explain what is ethical ghost hunting and why I'm such an advocate for it. When I first got into paranormal investigation, I didn't have shows like Ghost Hunters or Ghost Adventures making this seem normal. The experiences I had with spirits growing up made me the odd one with my classmates. They didn't understand that what I was experiencing, what was normal for me, actually wasn't normal for everybody else. And I wanted to find a way to show people that it was normal. Thankfully, in the area that I lived in, the Rhine Research Center was available and they had a paranormal team that was willing to bring on new people and teach them how to actually do investigations in a more scientific manner. And I loved being with them. I was with them for a while before I broke off on my own and started doing my own thing. Nobody saw that. Am I allowed to tell them? Katniss just jumped in the window and then fell into the trash can. <laughs> For those of y'all who don't know, this is Katniss Everpur. She's a little camera shy. You wanna look? This is my baby. And she is the oldest of our three pets. We got her in Japan when she was just a few days old. She's also the boss of me and likes to order me around. So, if you ever wonder who's in charge, it's her. Sorry, I was just holding Katniss and now my face is itchy. <laughs> I'm, I love my cats, but I'm also allergic <laughs> to my cats, so. When I broke off on my own, that's about the time that Ghost Hunters and other shows like that were becoming popular. And I was like everybody else. I was very enthusiastic for it because finally people were able to see what I experienced was real and that there are spirits among us and that it is commonplace to deal with them. I didn't really like how they tend to show the more terrifying side of spirits, the more misunderstood side of spirits, but it was good entertainment. When I started training teams and individuals, I just realized at that point how much misinformation was out there. People are watching these shows and trying to intera uh, interact with spirits by imitating what they saw on the shows and expecting the same results. They thought that they could go into a location and demand something happen and it happens instantly. And it's not like that. Also had a lot of people who, and of course this has made the, has made the news quite a few times where people who were ghost hunting would break into locations or sneak into abandoned locations. And that just causes problems for people who do this legitimately. You can't go into a location without permission. That's part of ethical ghost hunting. You have to have permission, be it a permit from the county, the city, whatever, to go in there, permission from property managers or the realty company that owns it or the family that lives there. You have to have permission. Legally, you have to have permission, but it also, again, 
if you want to do things right, it makes it easier for other people who want to try and experience the same things to be able to come back and try and get the same results. Especially if it's someplace that it's somebody's personal property or business. Because then you're just messing with their livelihood or their lives. Unfortunately, I have met many individuals who would go to homes where the families, not understanding what was going on, thought it was demonic energy and they would go in there screaming demands, screaming curse words, throwing around holy water and just terrifying everybody, including the family that lived there or business owners because I've seen it happen at businesses as well. And that's not how you do things. The spirits that are there, they think that that's still their home or that's their business or some special memory to them. And that's why they keep going back there. So when you go in, after you have your permission, you go in there and you treat them as if they're still living. You talk to them, you greet them, you introduce yourself. You say why you're there. And then when you're actually investigating you explain the equipments to them how to use them how to interact with them and what would happen if they interact with them if you do this if there are spirits there most likely you're going to get some sort of response if you get a response don't be like some of these idiots and you'll probably figure out who I'm talking about and I don't want to name them because I don't want to get sued Anything that happens, don't automatically say it's demonic. Don't say it's out to harm you. Don't scream, don't curse, don't run away. Don't jump to conclusions. Just carry on the conversation. That's all you have to do. Places that I've gone to that have been claimed to have demonic energies or demonic activities, it's usually a misunderstanding on some level. It's a spirit that's trying to protect their home, protect their business, protect themselves, protect families or friends that might be there because multiple spirits can be there and they may be trying to protect who they perceive as a little bit weaker and they see investigators and possibly even the family members as people intruding on their space, their lives, especially if there's the people that are coming in are screaming and cursing. So treat them with respect. When I go to an investigation, I introduce myself. I say why I'm there. I say I just want to talk to them. I actually bring presents. Even if the family is like, oh, it's demonic, whatever. I bring some sort of presence. Typically what I do is if it seems to be male energy, I bring alcohol or tobacco. Typically they respond to those in either direction. Um, if it's a female, I bring flowers. I make note in all of my notes what flowers they are, what they smell like, and how strong the smell is. So that way, if somebody comes in later and they're like, I get a whiff of rose, we can rule out it's the bouquet that I brought in. If I happen to have roses in the bouquet. Um, for children, I bring teddy bears and candy and dolls, depending on what the ages and stuff are and they appreciate those. It's a housewarming present, I mean, not housewarming, but it's like a hostess present. And it helps soothe things and it helps open dialogues. It also makes them more willing to talk and be around us. When you go in, you use calm, you use soothing voices. If something happens, you try not to react, you try not to jump, you try not to scream. It's hard, I know. There have been one or two times where I have jumped and once, thanks to Al, that I did scream bloody murder, but in all my years, one time of screaming bloody murder, I count that as a success. But he was also playing a prank on me, so. um. Sorry, my neighbor is in the backyard watching me film this. So it's kind of awkward. But yeah, bring gifts. 
Another thing about ethical ghost hunting is you don't just rely on personal experiences as proof. You need to have tools to help prove it, be it video cameras, recordings, obelisks, spirit boxes, thermal cameras, whatever. But you have to have tools to back up those other tools. You can't take an obelisk or a spirit box for what it just says. Too often it's easily influenced. You can change the speed at the channels that a spirit box is going through, which can slow it down so that way you're more likely to pick up radio stations or talk shows or things like that, which can influence the evidence you get. An ovulus, unless you have one that has a digital readout, it's very hard to understand what is being said and oftentimes can be misinterpreted. If you go to my video about Lake Shawnee, it's a few videos earlier, I do have an obvious session and I do know that I'm not 100% sure on some of the captions that I put up. I did my best. I listened to it for hours trying to figure out to the best of my ability what it was. But I know several people have said, I think it may have said this or I'm, it may have said that. And that's fine. That's what they hear. It doesn't mean my answers are wrong. Their answers aren't wrong. It's just an interpretation. That's why you need to have EVP sessions. If you get an EVP that says something along the same lines as what you got on a spirit box or an ovulus, then you have proof of something. Sorry, my neighbor <laughs> still watching me. <laughs> like he stopped raking his yard and is just watching me. It, it's creeping me out, making me lose track of what I'm saying. But anywho, when you're using tools, you also have to make sure you're not influencing those readings. For example, when I have a team going out, I'm very, very strict on what is being worn and what's not allowed to be worn. Everything from how hair is done, makeup, clothing, everything. First things first, I have them wear all black or as close to black as they can get. Nothing with prints, images, anything like that and nothing with sparkles, reflective surfaces. If it has a reflective surface, they have to tape it up. And that includes their shoes. No jewelry because that's a reflective surface. No jeans with stuff on the back pockets because I have actually seen videos and I will try and find that video and put it in a future video uh, on YouTube. Um, it was one of the My Ghost Story um, segments and it was two paranormal investigators that got really excited because as they were getting up after an EVP session and exiting a room, a orb followed them out the room. What I realized after watching that is they had rhinestone, one of them had rhinestones on their back pockets. When they stood up, the angle was just right with the IR camera to reflect off of one of the rhinestones and you can see that it follows the same path as where they, the way they stand up and walk out. It's just a reflection off the rhinestones. And I have seen on investigations where the shiny part of someone's shoe makes it look like there's something floating right behind their foot while they're walking. So I'm very, very strict about what is worn no jewelry, no makeup, because makeup can actually show up differently on uh, thermal images, IR cameras. It can, if it's got glitter of any kind or a sheen, it will show up on camera. One moment. Alexa, pause. Sorry about that. Baggy's music hour just started. <laughs> um, 
he has anxiety really bad and one of the things that we do is we play classical music for him for two hours every day he'll get his music when i'm done recording this and it will be for longer than two hours since i cut into his time but anyway back to what i was saying makeup can show up oddly on cameras because it could be reflective it could have sparkles the sparkles can travel elsewhere on your face and you don't know it so you may have a sudden little flash on your cheek and we can't sit there and be going well is that glitter from her eyeshadow or was that a spirit so to rule all that out i don't allow any makeup or jewelry another thing i don't allow is scented deodorant scented lotions perfumes anything of that nature i don't care if your body stinks when you're on an investigation that's just natural we can rule out that scent what i don't want to waste time on is sitting there smelling roses and going well is that rebecca's perfume or was that a phantom scent that we just had especially if it's a location known for phantom scents and then one that I just recently started implementing because of personal experiences is having hair tied back if possible. I mean, mine's really short. I can clip it back so that way it's not an issue. But that way, if we're getting feelings on our face, on our necks, on our shoulders or whatever, we can rule out our own hair. Um, it also helps get rid of spider webs and things of that nature a lot faster than running around screaming beating your hair which I have seen plenty of people do and I may have done on an occasion or two um but again it just it helps rule out things that we may be accidentally using to contribute to supposed evidence the more that we're able to control what we do and what we put out the better quality our evidence is going to be Another thing with the black clothing is when you're using thermal imaging or IR cameras, if you're in black clothing and if you're pale like me, you need to wear as much black clothing like long sleeves, turtlenecks if possible, because it's going to help cut down on your reflections in surfaces, windows, things of that nature. There have been times on investigations, and I've even seen it in TV shows as well, where something pops up as a possible spirit because they see a heat signature on something. And what they don't realize is lighter clothing, short sleeve clothing, things of that nature, is going to show a heat sense on a reflective surface, or an IR camera is going to show that reflection a lot easier than if you're wearing dark clothing. So again, to control the environment and the situation, if you wear all black, you're less likely to accidentally pop up somewhere um, or make it look like you're popping up somewhere, I should say. But another thing about ethical ghost hunting is you don't make demands. You don't go in there and say, hit me, touch me, show yourself. You ask, do you want to come talk to us? You ask if it's okay to come into their place, the, their home, their business, whatever. You give them permission if you want. And I really try hard not to tell investigators to do this. But you can give permission, hey, if you want, touch my hand or touch my shoulder. You're welcome to do that if you want to. Try not to do that because at the same time, that can also involve a, invite a chance of them accidentally hurting you. They don't always know their strength. And so when somebody gets scratched after sending that invitation out or demanding it like i've seen so many people doing especially on shows you can't turn around and be like oh well they scratched me that's demonic they're trying to harm me no you just 
told them they could touch you and they tried to touch you and maybe they you didn't feel it the first time so they tried a little bit harder and it was a little too hard you have to be understanding the next little bit about ethical ghost hunting is when you're done be sure to say goodbye say thank you say it even if you didn't get anything you still need to be appreciative to the spirits to the people who live there to the people who gave you permission to be there because that will help open the door to being able to come back and try again to talk to them or other teams to be able to come in and try and experience what you experienced. And if you did go to some place where people were renting, or not renting out their home, but you went to their home or their business to get evidence, if you do have evidence or you don't have evidence, you need to follow up in a timely fashion with them. Let them know what you did or did not get. I have seen teams that will sit there and go to a location, do an investigation, and then not say anything for six months or more. I get it. Life gets in the way. Life is busy. Life is crazy. But if somebody allowed you into their home, into their business to do an investigation and they're waiting to hear what you got, then you need to let them know in a timely manner. I typically try to do within two weeks, I'll say four weeks, just in case life happens, but I do try and get my evidence and stuff to them within two weeks. Find a time frame that's good for you and let them know about that time frame, what to expect and deliver. Even if you don't have anything, if you go through everything and you don't have anything, be honest with them. Let them know. We didn't get anything this time. Would it be possible if we could come back out and try again? Spirits are not performing monkeys. They may have been too shy or they didn't know what was going on or they didn't want to show themselves. But if you come out and you show the same good behavior that you showed before, they may be more comfortable with you coming out. Sorry, my neighbor is still. <laughs> ah, this is the most awkward video. I, I, I'm sorry. Um, but I think I'm just going to leave it at that for right now. This is, I mean, those are the basics of ethical ghost hunting. Just be a good person. Be smart about what you do and how you do it. And don't try to ruin it for other people don't be a jerk don't imitate what you see on tv shows if you have a question or a concern or something like that don't hesitate to reach out to me all my emails contact information is listed down below in the description box and i'd be more than happy to talk to you i'm so happy to share my knowledge and learn from others as well and just you talk about spirits in general. This is a passion of mine and I love sharing it with others. There is a lot more that goes into ethical ghost hunting, but this is just the basics. <laughs> I wanted to get that out because I don't think I've gone over ethical ghost hunting in any of my previous videos. And it was definitely time that I explained a little bit more about it. Sorry if it's kind of confusing, chaotic, and doesn't quite make sense. I apologize. I have a lot of distractions going on with this video. I really need to find someplace quieter and away from my neighbors to record. <laughs> but I love having my cats be in the same room as me if they choose to be, or John Paul if he chooses. He's currently downstairs. But that's enough rambling for today. I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much for watching this video. Um, 
at the end I will have a playlist available for you if you haven't seen any of my previous videos please go check out that playlist it'll give you a better idea of who I am what I do and just the kookiness that is my life so have a great weekend and I will see y'all again on Tuesday with a new video Bye. Is it